Hello everyone, this is Simaya Kar. I'm a chair of IEEE Women Engineering Turkey section this year, and you're watching Empowering Women Summit 2020. So this is um, this is a special event, and we are actually uh, hosting amazing, amazing speakers from uh, 8th of December till 17th of December. And today we are starting with an, an amazing woman, an, an IEEE leader, and also a leader um, in several fields. And when we're actually thinking about, you know, like a strong and woman, inspiring woman in our life, you know, like we need to count also Margareta Eriksson is one of our leader in IEEE in her, in, in her volunteer commitments as past IEEE director. And she has also several other roles. And also she has an um, amazing role, um, professional career as well that we would like to um, invite. I would like to invite Margareta to introduce herself and deliver her speech. And today's topic is from peasants to professors. Um, and. Uh, I would like to remind all the audience, and this is an interactive session, we'll have a Q&A section. Anytime during Margareta's uh, presentation, you can leave your message and, um, and we will address your questions during the Q&A section. First, we will be hearing Margareta. Margareta, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Sima. It's, it's such a pleasure to be in this meeting. Uh, as I said to Simai, I miss the, the real life experience a lot. But this is as close as we can come and actually the reach that we have by, by having these virtual meetings is actually quite amazing. I've been uh, sitting in meetings the whole day uh, through Zoom and the Teams and other means, and it just works. Uh, we're sharing documents, we're doing work together. And I think that is something that was never ever dreamt of when I started this journey, which I'm gonna tell you about. Uh, as uh, Simai uh, said, I'm the past Reunite director. Uh, so my journey through the leadership, top leadership of Reunite is actually goes six plus two years. Uh, which brings us back to 2012 something when I was given an award and one of our senior members, Tarek Dorani uh, from, uh, from Scotland said, Megriatha, I think you should be a candidate for being region eight director. And I said, you think so? <laughs> that was after a good dinner. And he said, yeah. I think you have, I'm, you should go for it. And I said, okay, uh, given what I would come back to in the very end of my presentation, that if someone trusts you to do something, say yes. So by that, I will start my presentation. That actually brings us back to more than 150 years ago. And I see how it works now because it's, Oh, this is short about me. Uh, I live in Stockholm area. Uh, I spent more than 18 years in school. Uh, I'm still at school, actually. <laughs> Take another course in uh, security architecture. That was my work this afternoon. I have a Master of Science in Electrical Engineering and uh, a Master's in Information Security. Uh, I'm an entrepreneur. I had my own company for 28 years. Uh, now I'm an employee of CDI, which is a major IT company based out of Canada, but with a global presence. I'm a lecturer in information security and risk analysis at one of our uh, universities in Sweden. I'm a consultant. That's my daily work. I was married and I'm divorced. Am I happy? <laughs> Uh, I have many number of firsts. I was the first female leader of our national uh, electrical engineering organization. That took only 114 years <coughs> to reach that position. Uh, URL is an umbrella organization of national organizations for electrical engineering in Europe. And I became the president of that. Uh, I was elected 
actually, by the same time in the late, just before 2000, 1999, I was elected the student section chair of IEEE. I was uh, recruited from someone that saw my potential and I said, why not? And my position now is, well, as past director, I was the director of uh, up to two years ago and uh, actually to this weekend we're going to have the handover meeting so then I'm leaving office for real. But I will bring you back to my great grandmother, Erika Eriksson. She was born in 1861. That's some time ago. But she didn't have at all those opportunities that I and you have. She went to three years of part-time school provided by the preacher in our community. Uh, she was a maid, uh, she became a wife, a mother, and she was her life was being a farmer. And happy and unhappy situations, she became a widow 1904. She was 43 years old at that time. And she had three daughters, my mother, the youngest, and two teenage, one teenager and one 11 years old. You will see them soon. Uh, can you imagine how it was to become a single mother with a farm in 1904? I cannot, but we have some paper that she wrote in the 1940s about how it was, and it wasn't easy. Uh, she kept a farm, uh, despite that uh, some people said that she should not, and she hired hands for the hard work. She kept the horse, she kept the cows, and the forest. These are ladies are the daughters, my grandma, my, and her, my aunties, <coughs> and they, they were amazing women too. Uh, Maya was to become a teacher. And at that time, uh, it wasn't easy. Uh, there were no really seminars for teachers. So she had some kind of homeschooling. I don't know how it happened, but again, a teacher saw that she had talent. So he helped her out to do, get books, to get uh, opportunities. And uh, since her mother, my great grandma, she thought education was vanity. I've been told that she was sitting in the outdoor toilet. There was no indoor toilet at that time, as you know, uh, studying. Can you imagine you're sitting in a, in a dry toilet, uh, whatever weather is, to do your study? Lights? No, maybe from kerosene. Uh, quite tough. Uh, her sister, Stina, also became a primary school teacher because she was inspired by her sister to go forward. Although she actually went to a proper uh, teacher's seminar and graduated in 1922. Uh, so just two years between, between them when they graduated. So I think they had great support from each other. My grandma, which was the oldest of the three daughters. She took over the farm and married a, a carpenter. Uh, he had to learn farming. <laughs> it wasn't his game, but he had to learn. I think he did a good job. And she had another three daughters. Uh, so first of all, what to remember from this? Well, my grandma's generation, it was World War II, life was tough. Uh, for us to get married and we can divorce, whatever we like, uh, 
at that time, marriage was a reason for dismissal if you had an employment. And since my my aunties, they became teachers, for some strange reason, they could keep their jobs even if they're married. And just about this time of the year, in 1919, women in Sweden got voting rights. And the first elections when women actually could participate was in 1921. So imagine today, compared to this, it's a completely different thing. But we're not done yet. Uh, this is some pictures from, from the family at that time. The house is still there. <laughs> <clears throat> I mean, my brother painted it this summer, actually. Uh, on the picture below, you see my grandpa and grandma and the great-grandma, which is here. She's pretty old here. She's uh, almost into 80s. And the three sisters. There were cows. We live by lake. And life was farming and forestry. So means we're not that big, but somehow we survived. So to my mothers and my mother and her sisters, uh, again, my, my family is quite odd when it comes to when we were born. So two sisters born uh, 1916 and 1918, and then my mother uh, 12 years later, uh, they sort of had, shared the same path as uh, the previous generation. Uh, they were maids, homemaids, but they moved to Stockholm, to the capital of Sweden. And then they started to take on their own education uh, in the evenings. So my sister, uh, Auntie Mai, she became a tailor, a cook. But she soon found out that that was not a career to do. So she studied hard and became at some time the chief registrar at the courts of law. And she was a very organized person. So I've been hearing from her daughters that ask my, she knows where things are and how it's organized. She's very good at that. Uh, my other auntie, Vivi, uh, she started up as a maid, a cook, and uh, finally, well, in, in her 40s, uh, 50s, she became the chief secretary of the Nordic Council. The Nordic Council is a cooperational unit between the Nordic countries. And uh, I ha they were host in what's now the, uh, the government buildings. So I came there as a teenager and uh, up the stairs, uh, knocked the door on the Nordic Council, and that was my auntie, the secretary. Very proud. <laughs> and then my mother. Uh, her life started as a waitress, a cook, a uh, caretaker, and then she inherited the farm. And uh, she also made a career as a politician. So life is, is really different. But notice, they have no formal out, uh, education. It's only, only, not only this is hard work. It's occasional studies in the evenings. Uh, it wasn't web-based at that time. It was uh, called mailing. And they had different courses, evening courses on distance, similar to what we have today, but in a different format. If we look at what they had to go by, they had six years of primary school and evening schools, as I said, and postal vocational studies. That was World War II that struck this generation. And actually, it had changed that marriage was okay. You could not be dismissed from employment by marrying. 
So uh, neither of my aunties were housewives. They were uh, professional women in their own rights. Well, we're turning into the 60s and the 70s. So this is my family. And <laughs> given the tradition of having a, a late coming kid, this is my younger sister. She's born in 71, so even 14 years after I came to Berlin, 12 years after my brother. And she's now turning 50, can you imagine? <laughs> So in my generation and beyond, I would say, we have at least nine years of primary school and we have preschool now as well, which I didn't have. And then we have secondary school and we have university and everything is free of charge in, in Sweden. So people take these opportunities. And when I do the accounting in my family, in my close family, you can see how education has really made a difference. So I made a count you know, that we have two Bachelor of Science. Uh, one of them is me. Uh, we have two Masters of Arts, becoming teachers. That's my sister and her husband. Uh, no, actually, I have a Master of Science, a Bachelor. I have also a Bachelor's degree. Uh, we have two lawyers, uh, that's my cousin and her daughter. We have four physicians, that's another cousin, her husband and their two kids. And in that family of physicians, we actually have, we have three PhDs and actually the fourth has done her dissertation. And three university lecturers or professors. That's such an amazing development from the 1860s. I don't think ever my grandma would say that education is vanity. So what I'm coming to is that teachers makes a difference. There's a teacher that encouraged us, see, sees our talent and uh, see my talent encouraged me to do, to go on, take another step. And also the support in the family, that's really important. And it has been noticed also when we talk about integration in school of foreign people coming from foreign countries in my country, Sweden, that it helps that this, uh, the family, the mother and the father actually encourages studies. <laughs> And we see a big difference when from people coming from, for example, uh, Iran, uh, very studious, very many go to university and uh, become great people. And we see people coming from other places like Syria or parts of Africa where education has not been in that level. And uh, they also suffer from that in in our society. And, and our society as well is suffering from that, I would say. Uh, important people are also role models and mentors. Uh, they may be those we don't, we don't, when I was a kid, I didn't see my uncle Nils as a role model or mentor, but I thought he had such fun work. And he was a telecoms engineer at Ericsson. And every summer he came with a bunch of Popular Mechanics magazine to share with us, to me and my brother, and we loved it. It was in English, but somehow there were plenty of pictures and we learned English in school. So I got to read English that way. Also, I had a very inspiring math and biology teacher. Uh, he's uh, still around, Bormann. And uh, I don't know, my physics teacher, but they, they had fun with what they were teaching and working with. And I also had a very inspiring math teacher in secondary school. Uh, she invited the whole class. We loved her and she loved us. So she invited us for 
uh, Christmas festivities. And uh, when we left in third grade, uh, we had a big party with her. <laughs> we just, it was so good. So role models is really supporting us, not only when, when they are there, but also later. So I beg you to think, who is your role model? And uh, how many? Have a number of them. And actually, I learned a little trick, how to find who is a role model for you. Is there someone uh, that you envy? That's someone that you actually look up to and say, I would like to be like he or she. It could be he or she. Uh, that's a role model to find. Uh, I have some international role models. Uh, I think Indira Gandhi uh, was one of them. Madeleine Albright from the US. Uh, and she actually was a refugee from Czech Republic. And not often so much told about. And she has set up a, a foundation for women, uh, to support women. Margaret Thatcher, a chemist by studies, Prime Minister of England. Um, people have uh, views about her and what uh, she has done or not done, but I think she was a very strong and, and inspiring person, whatever you think. And Angela Merkel, she's also a chemist, uh, now the uh, Chancellor of Germany and on her way out, but she's been like a pillar of European Union, really, saying, no, this is the way to do it, in a German state of art way, state of mind way. I have some scientific role models as well. Uh, and the first one, I don't even remember the name of, uh, but she was, she made a difference to me, really. Uh, I was going to finishing school, cooking school for one year, and all my schoolmates, they well, aiming for becoming mothers, um, start to work for uh, housely means. And she was having, and I was then trying to get uh, a lift, uh, you know, standing by the road and waving your hand and saying, can someone bring me to, to the city? And she stopped and she had a, a uh, brand new Volvo. This was in uh, 74. I had aspirations for becoming an engineer. I always had. But she was really making the difference. That she had her own car. She was driving around. She was well-dressed and well-equipped. And she was a free woman. And I said, if she can do this, hmm, I'd like to do that too. Uh, later on, I learned about women like Ada Lovelace, uh, the first computer programmer, as we now know it. Marie Curie, um, double Nobel laureate, which is pretty interesting. And this year, actually, we have two women uh, who are Nobel laureates uh, with this uh, CRISPR uh, knife, Jan genetics manipulations. I think that's fantastic. Uh, Greta Voxian was the first female electrical engineer uh, in, from my school in Sweden. That was 1928. And I had a chance to meet her when we had a jubilee uh, from my school. Grace Hopper, I think, is an amazing person. Uh, creator Cobble, as well as uh, a high rank military person. And I had a chance to meet with Professor Emeritus Mildred Dresselhaus. Uh, she was the uh, winner of the IEEE uh, Prize for Enduring Engineering. Fantastic person, too, when she told her about her story. Uh, I think it, you can find it actually in the uh, IEEE um, archives uh, that's uh, recorded what she, her, her speech really, uh, truly amazing <laughs> and plenty of humor. So uh, 
coming to what I would like to share with you is some career advice. First of all, create your own career. Do what you think is rewarding. You will become successful that way. And for the family, because most of us want to have a family, it's about you and your partner. And the balance for work and family may vary throughout time. Make sure that your husband is also within the contract of having kids. Because uh, if you don't have nannies, uh, kids usually, the responsibility for kids usually fall on the female part of the family. And it uh, should not be so. It's uh, something that we do together and we should also take care of together. Uh, as a professional woman, uh, I would say that education gives freedom. So even if it sometimes is really tough and hard, uh, courses are like, whew, uh, just do it because it's creating freedom for you. And use that skills, that knowledge. Uh, don't waste it. I'm kind of sad when I see very talented women uh, having PhDs and then they decide to have kids and they have kids and have kids and they lose their, their position. It might be a good life, but I think it's a waste of, waste of good, good talent. And by earning your own money, you have the freedom and you can also become a role model for those who you will work with. And as an entrepreneur, you can be your own boss. It's a very hard boss. <laughs> and sometimes very friendly and very good to work with. And again, uh, female engineer, entrepreneur, be a role model for people you work with. It's, it's, it's a lot of fun, actually, to inspire people. And uh, thank you, Simai, for being inspired. And I hope you, I want to inspire more of you attend this but what what does it take then to to become a successful person well i think first of all there are something that you have you need to be in that intelligent and you need to have the energy to do what you want to do have ambition and aspirations uh, don't be shy of them and then it takes hard work be willing to study, to learn. And I would say, if nothing else, say, yes, why not? When asked, when asked to sit on a board, when asked to volunteer for something in my IEEE, yes, why not? Always try it. If it's something you like, we'll go on. If it's something that you don't like, well, you can skip it and say, oh, I tried this and it was not my piece of cake. Uh, there's, of course, some external factors that helps too, like having a good family support, uh, inspiring family and friends that can be your role models, teachers, as I said, and, and role models that you pick yourself, dead or alive. Mentors could also be dead or alive. Uh, one of my uh, persons that I admire is Leonardo da Vinci. He was like a multi-genius of all sorts. It's so fascinating. How did he think? How did he come up with this so many hundred years ago? Societal support. In Sweden, I can lend money from the government to support myself when I study. And education is for free as well. And that's, that makes a big difference. Uh, it's even equal for men and women. So it's so helpful. Uh, a job market that is open to men and women, of course. And the network that you create by being part of IEEE or any other organization that is of interest to you, where you meet people and can actually challenge yourself and learn new things. So... I would like to end 
by saying a good education can change anyone. A good teacher can change everything. Thank you. Margaret, thank you so much for sharing and inspiring. You know, that is really important. Like, actually, it was the main highlight um, was the having a real role models, like how it changes our life, right? So thanks for being a role model for many women and men all around, you know, just all around the world and um, from from your environment. So you inspired many of uh, many of the IEEE volunteers and also many professionals as well. So, uh, and it was really great to hear the motivation behind, you know, like there, there are always so many um, elements behind who made us the person who we are today, right? So actually like, um, in, in, in for several reasons, having those role models, all the education and how we improve ourselves. So it really makes us the, the, the person we are today. So and today, like um, in, in so many years over, um, well, I personally know you over the years and you're the one, we have, we have one of you, you know, amazing role models for the people around you. And thank you. <laughs> Well, thank you. Uh, I'd like to add, I didn't say that, but you maybe, you, I'm sure you noticed that there were three, do three daughters and there were another generation of three daughters. And uh, I have a sister and also a brother. And so in my family, it's so natural that women take the lead. There has been no men to, to be the leaders. So we have, well, it's just the way it is. And, and it's so in my genes that, well, who else to tell me what to do? <laughs> I know what to do. Well, actually, um, you know, just as like um, from our generations that we, we all have those real role models. It's not just one person. So as you already described, it, it's like some um, our three, 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 four generations those women and actually our family members that we met first really, really um, shapes our life and future. Absolutely. And later, yeah. And later on, we meet with meet, we meet with other people around us, like our teachers, like uh, when we volunteer in the place, or our managers, and and um, how to say it's actually leadership because we generally get inspired from the real leaders, you know, like does um, no matter what the title or the positions they are. So those people and our friends, so our social peers, right? So, um, but our base is really important. So that also helps us to shape the whole environment around us. Oh, yes. And I think for engineering, it's it's very practical. Uh, it, it's solving day-to-day -day problems. And, and when you learn that from early age, that you're able to do it, uh, who else should do it? Uh, if you see the inspiring work of what the engineers do and and, and live, uh, it makes a big difference. So if all of you that uh, listen to this, think about bringing your uh, siblings, your uh, friends, kids, uh, and, and show them the wonders of engineering and explain how it works. Uh, and think today, about, yeah, that, that is so much fun. <laughs> and today, with all those initiatives we do, actually, you're leading uh, one of the, the largest regions. Uh, you're the past director of IEEE Region yeah. 8. So that is actually a huge commitment. So like we have very respect, respected uh, leaders. And in, in past years, so you, you had a lot of... Um, opportunity to inspire many people around you because you know like you were the natural leader there so um you know just like i would like to hear from you how um what how is the feeling because you know like um you just like not just that you enjoy only but you know like by naturally being a leader so like when you help the people around you when you lead um, when you have these kind of initiatives that you have a lot of um passion to do more 
to give back to the society. So how how does it work and how is the the motivation being a leader for such huge region? So we have a huge family. <laughs> uh, I think it's it's the people part, the the possibility to make a change where where it's needed. Uh, and I can't do everything. However, by work, by inspiring others to do what what is right in their world, in their local uh, environment, whether it's in in an African country or whether it's in uh, in a very developed world, uh, what what we consider developed, but development in so many. Uh, comes in so many nuances so it's uh, what is uh, there's always a chance to do things better to have it more efficient to make it more uh, um, make it better whatever better means in, in that society and I think by delegating to find out what is best for your group your local society for your country uh, we get an optimal solution rather than say, telling uh, someone that we, we see this thing in in the european union that uh, we have different uh, geography we have different uh, assets and what is good for the forest in northern europe is seen as uh, detrimental in southern Europe. So again, find local solutions is, is where, where we can find them uh, by people who can actually execute on them as well. So what I think what I triple is, I've been passionate about Africa uh, and the, the Af countries of Africa in my triple E. So we now have the African Council and we have a body that actually can work and, and coordinate efforts when needed. Uh, and that means that countries with like Kenya or Nigeria, which are and South Africa and, and well, this, the southern tip of African continent as well as northern Africa, like Egypt and uh, Tunisia and so on, can actually help out uh, elsewhere, whether it's a, a common language, whether it's Arabic or whether it's French or English, uh, and the uh, students coming and going so they can bring good stuff home to wherever they live and, and lift their community. And I think that mechanism is, well, it gives me the goosebumps. <laughs> and that, that makes all the difference. Well, I would like to show uh, the message that he, for you, uh, from oh. Jonathan Duncan is another wonderful, inspiring uh, leader, um, past IEEE Women Engineering Chair. So uh, she is she is also watching, and I would like to sh uh, share actually this message for you. Thank you, Bojana, and also everything you do. And uh, you know, like having amazing women uh, like you, like Bojana, it really makes a big difference. So we are actually touching each other's life. This is very important. Thank you, Buzena. And I'm actually, I saw there was a, a request for candidates for uh, becoming uh, elect for women in engineering. And I'm, I'm pondering. <laughs> <laughs> so you say, well, go for it. I will go for it. <laughs> <laughs> because I think it's important. Uh, female... Uh, Female leaders are, are more visible, I would say, in, in our engineering world as well. And that, that makes a difference. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And how is it, what, well, how is the leadership in a multicultural environment? So as an NGO, like as a region, also we are very multicultural, but as oh, yes. I we are very global. So how, what are your advices for leadership and, and such a multicultural and diverse environment? Oh, be yourself. Uh, there's no uh, no square 
that you could use for being uh, appropriate for <laughs> you have to be yourself and, and be sensible with sometimes with what you're saying um, you can you can use it both ways sometimes you can actually know that you are I, I, I'm I'm not familiar with the culture so I'm actually excused for doing certain things because well she doesn't know and that okay sorry <laughs> I learned something uh, and you're excused for that uh, so I can actually play with that and and on, on the other hand is I said be human because I think all of us like to be treated as humans uh, and we bring different cultures with us, whether we come from a Nordic country or coming from uh, France or from wherever. We have different traditions. And I think that's the beauty also of different sorts of leadership because uh, what my, uh, but the director now, Madalena uh, Salazar Palma from Spain, well, she has her way of doing things and that's uh, also working very well. And soon Antonio Luke, well, he wasn't from Spain, but he's another person. He would have his way. And, and so each and every director uh, puts his or her uh, hallmark on how to lead the organization. And we have bylaws and, and other stabilizing factors. So that means that we can actually utilize, utilize ourselves within those frames. Uh, so... I say, be yourself. Uh, don't try to put on someone else's clothes because uh, you will be, uh, you you will not feel good. You will not feel confident in that Lent costume. Absolutely, and you actually said that that is actually a beauty of a failure too. So every human has a right to fail, right? And they're all opportunities for growth oh yes as long as you fall forward and step up <laughs> and learn something yeah if you see them as an opportunity to learn something every human has a, a right to fail yeah yeah um, and and you you fail because you're learning something and uh, there also that's my my learning that there are always people there to help you out because yeah. they may see that you're about to fall. So ask for help. Uh, sorry, I, I'm a bit lost here. I, I need some advice. And, and they're happy to give advice. That is actually real beauty of, of the sharing and exchange information and knowledge between. So then um, in those kind of cases, all those humans like around us, so uh, we are lucky to have role models and leaders like you and uh, to give us guidance, right? And, and just to grow and improve. And learning is lifelong, which is beautiful. And thank you for being here and sharing all your stories with us. Thank so I would, like to, I would like to ask your last comments, advices and words before we close. My last comments and advice. Um, well, uh, be yourself, uh, because that's the best person you can ever be. Be proud, and if asked for uh, for doing something, say yes. Why not? Uh, you may withdraw later on, uh, but at least you have to take. Uh, you must be part of the lottery uh, to be able to win. Thank you very much for all those advices and your time here today with us. So it was really great, Hannah, to, to have you and host you in this Empowering Women Summit, Mar Margareta. Well, I hope that you take all the power that you have and that you need and use it wisely. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Simone, for inviting me. It's been a pleasure to have this chat and uh, all the best. Thank you so much. So this is an end of the session. And today we have more sessions are going on. 
and for the audience you can check the schedule from the website and our channels and empowering women summit will continue till 17th of december and thank you so much for following and we look, we look forward to meeting with everyone in the next session thank you thank you bye